Our next speaker is Rebecca Patterson with Vietnam Veterans of America. Rebecca Patterson is a US Navy veteran. Thank you, Rebecca. And an environmental health advocate whose work focuses on the health effects of military toxic exposures. As a high ground veterans advocacy fellow in 2019, she advocated for policies to reduce PFAS exposure and clean up water contamination originating from the use of aqueous film foaming, forming foam, AAAF, on military installations. She continues advocating for veterans and their families through her roles as Deputy Director of the Veterans Health Council of Vietnam Veterans of America and President of Veterans Voice of America. Rebecca holds a Master's of Public Health and Environmental Health Sciences and a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry. Rebecca? Thank you for that introduction. And I am going to share my screen because I have some slides. And I would also like to thank the committee and its staff for the opportunity to present today. One of the largest sources of PFAS exposure for service members and in some cases their families and the communities that they live in is from the use of aqueous film forming foam on military installations. This foam has been used to fight Class B or petroleum fires since 1970, so it is a source of exposure that has affected multiple generations of veterans all the way back to those veterans who served during the Vietnam War era. The legacy foams, which were the ones that contained PFOS and or PFOA, are no longer in use. Um, however, the Department of Defense did have some pretty significant stockpiles of these foams that they, um, they needed to dispose of. So the way that they did this, um, I know as late as last year they were doing it. I'm not sure if they've done any of it this year. However, they would... Um, they would send this foam to incinerators to be disposed of. And unfortunately, these attempts to destroy the legacy stock, um, to destroy the AFFF, really all it did was release the PFAS back into the atmosphere where it could just be reintroduced into the environment in a different way. So really extending um, military contamination even further. Additionally, um, the although there are um, non-fluorinated alternatives available for firefighting foam, the Department of Defense is still using foams that contain PFAS. And unfortunately, because the manufacturers do not need to share which PFAS are in there, we don't know which, which PFAS are in these new versions of AFFF. AFFF is a foam concentrate and the concentrate is mixed with water into a foam solution. That solution is aerated into the finished foam. When this foam deposits on the ground, if it um, is not contained, it can travel into our water sources. So it can make its way into surface water, it can also infiltrate to groundwater, and it can contaminate soil um, as it's making its way into water as well. And once the contamination makes it into water, it can expand far beyond um, the original source of exposure. So the, the PFAS contaminants can, can um, end up migrating much further away from the initial uh, contamination source. And unfortunately, what this means is that through decades of use of this foam on military installations, it has contaminated locations all across the United States. This map was put together by the Environmental Working Group, and um, they, through several FOIA requests and um, through obtaining data from the Department of Defense, they have... Um, the, the PFAS contamination has been confirmed or suspected at 678 military installations, and that is what this image on the left is. The purple dots are sites where a confirmed release of PFAS on a military installation um, has occurred, and the orange dots are suspected releases. Additionally, um, PFAS has been confirmed to have been in the tap water or groundwater of 328 of these military installations when they did testing. 
I hope to illustrate through this presentation how blood testing could help a PFAS exposed veteran gain access to VA healthcare. And in order to do that, I'd like to share a little bit of information about the Veterans Health Administration. So the VHA is part of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and it's actually one of three administrations within the VA. Uh, the other two are the Veterans Benefits Administration and the National Cemetery Administration. And the VHA is the nation's largest integrated healthcare system. It contains 145 VA hospitals, 300 vet centers, and almost 1,300 outpatient sites. And the VHA has four statutory missions, the first of which is to develop, maintain, and operate a national health care delivery system for eligible veterans. And I highlight the four eligible veterans piece here because uh, although many people assume so, um, not all veterans are actually eligible for VA health care. In reality, less than 20% of veterans receive all of their care from the Veterans Health Administration. I myself happen to be one of those, one of the members in that, in that um, 20%. The current projected veteran population is 19.5 million and approximately 10% of that number are women veterans, but less than half of those are even enrolled in VA care. So only about 9.2 million veterans are even enrolled in the system. And only about two thirds of that number, 6.45 million veterans, actually seek care from the VHA each year. So what that means is that there are a lot of veterans that are going out into the community um, to get care. They're not receiving their care through the VA. And um, if they're not informing their healthcare providers that they served in the military, um, they may not realize the significance of doing that. Um, and additionally, healthcare providers aren't asking patients if they uh, have any military service. There's really a very important piece of information that's missing in order to provide um, you know, well-rounded care for, for veterans. Unfortunately, there are quite a few different uh, toxic substances that service members could have been exposed to while they were in the service, um, either based on the location where they served, what kind of deployments they did, uh, as well as the type of job that they had in the military. So if that veteran status is not ascertained, there's really a, a pretty, pretty large piece of the puzzle that's missing. So it is very important for healthcare providers to ask all of their patients if they have served in the military. There is some basic eligibility criteria for access to VA healthcare. Um, I'm not going to detail it here, but once that criteria is met, enrollment does still depend on a couple of additional factors. Um, one way that veterans are able to gain access to VA healthcare is through a service connected disability. And a service-connected disability is a disability that is the result of a disease or injury that was incurred or aggravated during active military service. Um, so veterans can apply for disability compensation um, through the Veterans Benefits Administration for conditions that they believe are connected to their military service. In order for a claim to be approved, there are um, typically three pieces of evidence that a veteran needs to submit with their with their claim with their application. Um, they need to provide evidence of a current condition, so something um, that is is currently occurring in terms of a medical diagnosis of a disease or injury. There needs to be evidence of an in-service event, so exposure to some kind of toxic substance would qualify under this, and there needs to be a nexus, which is a medical opinion stating it is at least as likely as not, so a 50% medical probability that the current condition was caused by the in-service event. And since, um, you know, conditions can develop years or even decades after a veteran has separated from military service, it can be difficult for a veteran to establish that nexus, that nexus to establish that link between the event and the condition. And in some cases, it can also be really difficult to, um, to prove, you know, a particular exposure, um, especially as time increases um, between uh between when, when someone was in the service. 
if a veteran's claim is approved, a rating is assigned, um, and this is assigned based on disease severity, um, and that rating then translates into both disability compensation, which is a tax-free monthly payment for the service-connected disability, and this rating also translates into a priority group for access to VA health care, and there are um, there are eight priority groups. Um, however, I've only listed three here because they're the ones that are most significant for service-connected disabilities. So the takeaways that I hope to leave you with are that access to healthcare and disability compensation can have a tremendous impact on a veteran's quality of life. And that despite potential concerns of causing distress um, over you know, the fact that there's not treatment for PFOS exposure, blood testing can provide a critical piece of evidence to help veterans gain access to healthcare in the future. And it can also lead to earlier and potentially more frequent health screenings and other preventative care for conditions that are associated with PFAS exposure. Thank you.